So today, this, this event, we are really excited as part of our speaker series to be introducing Dr. Siobhan Jordan. Um, Siobhan is the founder of a company called Interface, and I'll have her share some more about that. But basically to cover what we're, we're going to talk about briefly as a description, um, her company is kind of like a marriage maker between businesses in Scotland and Scottish academia. And because of the pandemic, a lot of her projects and initiatives of what she's been doing have become really, really um, important to help businesses survive through the pandemic. And so um, Siobhan, just, you know, to kind of kick off, why don't you, you tell us a little bit about um, yourself and why you founded Interface? And welcome, by the way. Thank you so much, Irene, and it's been fantastic to join you all. I'm christening this my transatlantic session, um, and I know it's midday with you, but it's um, it's a it's beautiful evening here in Scotland in Edinburgh, where I'm based. So delighted to be joining you all. So, um, how did I get to be founding director of Interface? Well, that's a, that's a great question to start off with, Irene. Um, I, my background is, is quite mixed. I, I um, had my primary degree is in industrial biotechnology and that gave me a, a little bit of everything, you know, from process engineering to marketing to accountancy um, and throw in cellular and molecular biology in there as well. So you can kind of see that I, I, like a, I like a bit of an adventure and a challenge. But throughout my whole career, I've been involved in, um, I suppose, knowledge and education and how that actually makes an impact. And so um, for me, although I, um, I suppose, majored in looking at um, retinal diseases and re headed up a research team um, that was very much um, looking at um, retinopathies and cellular therapies, etc. Um, I, I think when I um, decided to kind of take a stand, stand back and look at my career, um, I was very attracted to the world between businesses and academia. And prior to actually um, establishing Interface, my role was actually looking at technologies that were coming out of Scottish universities that were available for investment. So that was actually looking and working with the universities to consider how could they form license deals with large companies or indeed create new um, companies, spin outs and startups. And whilst um, that was a fantastic job and it was very much about how you build you know, the team around an investment, when I was talking to lots of Scottish companies about would you be interested in a particular technology, the question always came back was, mm, not particularly interested in that one, but do you have a solution for my problem statement here, which was always a, a kind of a really interesting problem. And that was 15 years ago. And at that point in time, probably Scottish universities were very um, keen to, and, and still are very um, committed to the commercialization of their technologies. But there was also a growing interest in how could you better connect the world of business and academia to really release and make um, greater impact from lots of different knowledge, not just technology. And so the, the concept around Interface um, was born. It was really a, a match.com, helping companies to, I suppose, br build greater bridges. And so if you're a company on the outside of a university, You've perhaps never actually collaborated with the university previously. You may not even have a background of having been educated via a university. What you may see is actually lots of high walls, lots of doors that have perhaps complex you know, titles on them, like physics or even astrophysics or quantum technologies, etc. And that's a really daunting place. And so what we do at Interface is we actually break down and open those doors um, and help businesses to um, really create profitable connections. And so Match.com is probably a, a, a kind of, um, I suppose, an analogy. We're working with businesses to hear their needs and then translate those into opportunities that um, any of the academic disciplines can really connect and help those businesses. So I suppose it's been a bit of a checkered career, Irene, from um, having a research group right through to helping commercialize and start spin out companies and support those to investment right through to now where i have the privilege of um, 
working with thousands of businesses every year across the team um, and really matching them into the best of the best across Scottish universities. That's wonderful. And so if, if, if I were a business, like, I mean, how does Interface operate? How does it work? So it's a free impartial service that we offer, um, which are matchmaker for business. Um, and if I give an example, maybe that's the best way to illustrate it. So a couple of years ago, um, through a, a, a mutual um, connection, I was introduced to a, a, a new entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur called Andrew Bissett. And Andrew had an idea that um, wouldn't it be great if we could heat homes using different technologies, not just coming from electricity or gas. How about using te te technology like heat exchangers? And so I don't know if you've ever been to, perhaps you've never been to a cold football match where your hands need to be warmed up. And there are these little devices called hand warmers and you essentially break a metal strip in them and your hands that releases heat. And so Andrew's concept was, if you actually took that technology, could you almost break or catalyze a connection um, through particular materials that would heat your house. Now that's in the kind of simple layman's, I guess, version. But his question to me was, do you have Scottish, uh, any Scottish universities that have got expertise in phase change materials? Now, if we look across all the doors, across all the universities, there's no door that says phase change materials. But fundamentally what lies behind that is chemistry. And so just simplifying what we do, we heard the needs of Andrew as a, an entrepreneur. We understood that what he was seeking was an academic that was skilled in this particular aspect of chemistry. We were able to find three different groups, research groups across all of the Scottish universities that could help him. The match came um, and he selected working with the University of Edinburgh. And 12 years on, that's a multi-million pound business because through them, um, they worked through fundamentally the principle of proving Andrew's concept through a feasibility study. And that built a whole business that has actually got a huge significant amount of investment. And not only that, I think the bit that warms my heart is yes, there's economic impact and there's raised investment, but actually it's helping address fuel poverty in social housing, because actually it's a new way of heating homes and um, it's not just about the kind of convection and, and releasing lots of heat through radiators. It's actually a much better and a much more economical way of heating homes. So perhaps a, a kind of case study, I always think a picture is a thousand words, but in through that way, you can hear that we can work with companies, be it very, very early stage, or be it multi-million pound companies that are based um, you know, overseas. All of those have got particular problem statements. They might be short-term problem statements, they might be really long-term disruptive technologies. And our, I suppose, raison d'etre is really, let's quickly unlock all the relevant expertise that we can wrap around that company and they can actually, you know, really power ahead. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, I can imagine that for many small businesses, you know, the, the, the thought of collaborating with um, a university and all of the knowledge that goes with it would seem really quite daunting. Um, how, how do you go about helping small businesses really navigate through the system to find the right partner? And it is about navigating. I think core to Interface's principles is exemplar customer service. So it is very much about um, ensuring that no matter who approaches us and whatever channel they approach us, you know, be it um, tracking onto our website, be it a referral or otherwise, we really, um, you know, hear what they want and make sure that if it is correct to bring forward as a proposition to the universities that we make that uh, a quick turnaround we've got a two-week two turnaround time in um, identifying the uh, relevant expertise but if it's not re uh, relevant for universities or colleges it might be that actually other organizations uh, can actually help that business and so therefore as a small business you know they may be thinking oh you're a funder maybe we'll just approach you to you know fund our new building and um, and so we will quickly and um I suppose rapidly and um, support them to um, reach the right uh, mechanism support but equally well if they are got a fantastic concept and you know go back to many of the businesses that we approach or small businesses have come up with great ideas 
but they're really stuck at how those ideas can actually, um, I suppose, be proven. They need to de develop demonstrators. They need to um, get independent verification. Do their ideas have actually validity? And that's where we come in and we can really help um, identify who can, who can work with them. Now, some of them go no further than a conversation. You know, again, we've had basic businesses, small businesses with what they think is a fantastic idea. And then they have a conversation with an academic team and it turns out what they were trying to do was against the laws of physics. So no matter how well they try to develop that product in-house, it was never going to work. But that conversation really helps the business to perhaps not um, put resources against something that's never going to work. So that fail fast and fail quickly um, is just as important as the companies like Sunamp that I just described earlier, that's a multi-million pound business now because of academic, unlocking academic expertise. This is so fascinating. So if, if I think about, um, you know, Scotland as a country, Scotland takes a huge pride in its education system. Um, I myself was educated in, you know, a Scottish university. And I know that the, the professors and the students themselves are, are all very proud of the work and the research that they are outputting into Scotland. Ha the knowledge, you know, that they're creating, developing, how is this being um, transferred over to the country as a whole? Like, is this knowledge benefiting Scotland? It's a really good, good question. So I think from the work that we've done and, um, you know, and the companies that we've helped, we've got an in independent economic analysis that says it, can, um, it contributes about 19 million pounds to the Scottish economy every year and supports thousands of jobs. So if you take the economic piece, that's you know significant and that's just the interface part and the universities themselves are doing significantly more. And um, so that's hugely important to the Scottish economy in knowledge delivering impact. But I think a lot of the businesses, you know, perhaps their starting point is not just economics. Yes, all businesses want to make profit, but there's also an increasing drive to give back. And that's, I think, what's exciting some of the academics is the fact that the knowledge has much wider societal impacts and it can have much, much wider impacts to support, you know, some of the tools that we're developing that are actually supporting better education. And um, they can help in terms of, you know, a greener, fairer economy. Some of the principles that we now have in Scottish Government around um, low carbon economy, what we do with waste, how do we add value? So I think that the products, process and services that emerge from partnerships are not just supporting um, economic growth within Scotland, there's a whole ripple effect of um, huge impact. And I think also, you know, you mentioned about the strength of our education system in Scotland. One of the fantastic um, benefits of industry working with academia is helping the students be more um, employ employ employable. So employability has become a huge um, opportunity for students. How do we support students to get experiential learning early in their careers to work with businesses, to work with social enterprises, to work with you know a whole range of different organisations. Uh, I think I am so fascinated by um, you know many of the students are now doing really fantastic co-creation and co-design work as part of their undergraduate courses, and that is you know has got. Um, I suppose, accreditation from both the businesses and their academic supervisors. And, you know, when those students go for interview, um, a lot of what they can discuss in interview is actually drawing on the skills that they have um, undertaken as part of those programmes of work. Right. And how, how is this working um, during the pandemic? Like, I know the last year has been very difficult. A lot of the work that gets done with universities is is even kind of vocational on the job, like meeting people, working with prototypes. Like, how has the pandemic really affected many of the projects that you're trying to accomplish in the market? 
so it's been it's been interesting obviously there are some disciplines that have been um, hit hardest and you know research laboratories that were helping and supporting the medical response have stayed open because obviously some of the critical work in terms of developing and um, you know or providing evidence for vaccines for developing new um, health care etc have been absolutely critical to the medical response so that aspect of medical research has been um has um, been kind of, I suppose, committed, obviously, um, less capacity within the laboratories and adopting social distancing, etc. I think what we've also seen is huge new disciplines, um, disciplines coming to the fore to support um, businesses that perhaps may not have thought about how they would have um, supported businesses in the past. So one of the initiatives that we um, took on very early in the pandemic last May, was looking at sectors that have been hardest hit. Now, you will know, and I'm delighted to see so many people in the audience that will have a, a knowledge of Scotland, you will know that tourism and hospitality, so our food and drink sectors, our tourism sectors, are hugely important to Scotland. But they've been some of the sectors that have been hardest hit, particularly tourism, where many of the businesses have sadly had to close. Um, and so early in May last year, we worked with some of the tourism uh, alliance, tourism groups to um, come up with a campaign called Adopt a Business. And that campaign really um, worked across many of the academic um, teams in business schools. And we matched them into some of the tourism businesses to really kind of look at what were their action plans, what could they help and kind of, what some of them said, holding on to hope, what could they plan for the future when they were allowed to reopen um, post-pandemic. And so that's really helped, I suppose, develop a resilience within our, our tourism and hospitality sector. Many of those programs of work have really helped the tourism businesses to plan ahead to look at how can they maximise new, um, I suppose, new knowledge around immersive technologies, around virtual reality, around building that experience and engaging an online audience. And, you know, sitting here this afternoon, this morning, um, we've got a fantastic online audience. And I even said this morning, we couldn't have done, you know, survived and thrived through a pandemic if we were relying on old technology of the last of 10 years ago. If we were all trying to make mobile phone calls, how would we ever have connected? And so I, I think that whole digital experience has been a huge, um, uh, and through the Adopt a Business programme, has really helped our tourism and hospitality industry think about how they would actually um, open up and be much more, I suppose, about building their international connections, even through a pandemic. And that's just one example. I think there's been a lot of work through the food and drink sector of looking about new distribution models. Many of the food and drink companies that would have previously relied on distributors are now engaging directly with their consumers. And so that's challenged them to how do they actually connect, hear their consumers develop new products. And Although Scotland, uh, you know, has got a huge track record of um, real strength and innovation across life sciences, across engineering in our universities, I think what this pandemic has also shown is new disciplines in our business schools, but particularly around artificial intelligence, machine learning, has really come to the fore. So our digital data capabilities um, have really certainly driven a new wave of invention and um, innovation across um, both education, but across all sectors um, throughout Scotland. This actually kind of leads me to my next question. I was thinking about the types of support that you offer businesses, it sounds like you are generating much more support in the technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning types of initiatives um, because of the pandemic. Can you can you talk about the, how your support has maybe changed, you know, in terms of how you service the needs of these businesses? Like, how has that changed specifically? So in terms of, I suppose, even as interfaces as service, um, you know, we, we a year ago, we we're spending so much time meeting companies at events. We were going along to the premises and having meetings. We were, um, you know, we're a team of, of 20 that are scattered throughout the length and breadth of Scotland and um, from Highlands and Islands right down to the, the borders. And we would meet regularly as a team. And obviously, right, exactly a year ago, all that stopped. And I can remember, you know, like many team leaders will have conversations with their staff going, 
not sure what's going to happen next. And so we were preparing, I suppose, mentally as we're, will we not see any um, opportunities come through at all from businesses. But actually, the number of businesses that have approached us is up about a third, so we're up about 33%. Now, some of the um, major opportunities probably that have come our way has been actually a, 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 a opening of our international markets. So, um, you know, a year ago, I would never have dreamt of having this conversation because perhaps we wouldn't have even um, thought about media or using digital platforms to reach out and connect transatlantically. Um, equally well, you know, so many pe companies would have said to us, oh, you know, I have to come and you have to come and you have to tour of a factory. But now, you know, we would have lots of conversations where we can share video footage, we can bring um, very quickly and the right people into the room online and um, without having to wait for oh you know can i get the flights have i got to organize travel do i have time in my diary so i suppose from our point of view there's a greater agility mm -hmm. but equally well technology and technology has really driven that but i think technology has also driven a lot of our customer needs a lot of the clients com companies are really seeing how how can they use I suppose the data that they're gathering on their consumer preferences, on the customers of the, the current customers or the customers of the future, and how can they use that data. And then another really relevant example is very much how data is helping support um, the medical response as well. So one of the companies that we worked with um, has developed um, and developed a, a number of years ago, a technology that helps predict people that are living at home predict whether they're going to be more prone to falling. And obviously, if you've got elderly health, you know, parents or otherwise that may be living alone, you might be quite anxious that they are going to perhaps fall and, and require um, significant medical intervention. And although they had developed the technology and we had worked with them with linking them into Edinburgh Napier University to do all the artificial intelligence and machine learning, etc., and um, to really help and they have very sophisticated algorithms and predict, predict who might fall. They were having a hard time convince health authorities and local authorities that this was really good technology that should be adopted. But the pandemic changed all that when suddenly, you know, healthcare providers, NHS, had to look at significantly different ways of almost keeping people away from hospital. And so technologies like that have really come to the fore in keeping elderly and people safe in the environments and having greater um, predictability in, in greater machine learning and AI to be able to help support people at home. So telehealth. Um, has become a huge um, opportunity for many different universities and and, you know, and, co and companies working across Scotland. It's really fascinating and it's like just so wonderful to hear the advancements in technology that are being made there, especially at the right time, you know, with the pandemic. So there, there it sounds like there's many thousands of businesses that um, you've been providing, you know, free service support to to help make these marriage maker you know projects together for businesses and and the universities can you maybe um you know in the, in the last few years that you've been working talk about one or two of the partnerships that really stand out for you and and what made them different that's a really good question so i always i always like ones that almost you know touch touch the heartstrings, dare I say. Um, and I don't think there'll be anybody on this call that hasn't been touched by, you know, um, um, knowing family members or knowing friends that have been touched by perhaps dementia or touched by, you know, challenges around healthcare. And I think some of the um, programs that we have really helped in, in helping understand and bridge that gap are ones that are very dear to my heart. So I'll describe one of the partnerships that we worked with Studio LR, which is a design company. You know, so fundamentally, they um, really work with um, lots of different organizations in designing fantastic brands. But the lead person in that organization, Lucy Richards, heard me speak at an event a couple of years ago and she approached me and kind of said, look, I've always had this passion for how, as a brand agency, we can really help um, people to design better when they are designing public buildings. So, so often, you know, when you're designing public buildings, you like really funky, perhaps, architecture or symbols. Um, and so, you know, you might have 
on a, on a, a door of a, a, of a lavatory, some fantastic symbol to kind of represent, you know, what's going on, etc. But Lucy's challenge was that if you're a person with perhaps, you know, dementia or anything like that, it is incredibly difficult when you've got different signage in different locations. And that familiarity and that knowledge of knowing um, that, you know, you're, you're I'm going to say walking into the correct lab um, lavatory is hugely important. And it's not just lavatories, it's, you know, common symbols around people, around other aspects. And so she had come up with this concept around, you know, could there be a common currency, I guess, around developing a series of symbols um, that really help um, groups and, and help. But she really hadn't a clue how to almost go beyond the brand to, and the design to actually say, well, would these make a difference to pay patients with our families and carers with dementia? So we were able to link her into University of Edinburgh and University of Stirling. And um, through that partnership, they worked with focus groups and with um, practitioners that were actually skilled in fundamentally understanding the many different stages of dementia and caring and what actually fundamentally happens with respect to recognition. And one of my proudest moments has been the fact that that symbol that they have identified, and I can kind of share the link, um, has been adopted by many different architects. And I was sitting in Edinburgh Airport a couple of, when I could fly, so that's about a year ago, uh, a little bit more, about 18 months ago. And I was sitting outside um, a, a series of uh, lavatories, and here is this signage that had been developed in partnership with the universities actually showing and um, the, the kind of symbols of outside um, for um, patient, uh, for um, everybody to understand the kind of common and a little story about how it had been developed in partnership. And I think, oh, that was really nice because it's some, something fundamentally I had been involved in matching that connection. And I think, um, you know, that that's just probably one that doesn't, you know, is never going to make masses of money for the business, but actually has really taken forward um, a huge I guess acknowledgement that whilst we all might like particular, you know, uniqueness within architecture and buildings, actually there's some common threads and symbols that need to be respected because of everybody and, um, you know, being inclusive. Yeah, that's that's a really nice story there and, and something that will change people's lives, right? I mean, such a small thing, but very important. Do you have any more to share with us? <laughs> well, we've created over 2,600 2, partnerships and it comes some, some every day. So, hey, and if anybody's interested, there's a whole series of case studies on our website. So, um, you know, happy to, happy to um, peruse those and happy to hear the link. But I'll just very briefly give you another one, um, which is a, a multi-generational company that we've worked with. So essentially, Scott Mass is based in the Scottish Borders, beautiful countryside uh, near Kelso. And I started working with um, the I suppose, founder of the company, Derek Cameron, a number of years ago. And he had me proudly down to walk and um, walk around what was a very small um, um, factory at that point. Um, and I've continued to work with Alistair, his son, who's now the new MD or the, the kind of taken over the MD of the company a, a number of years ago. And so Derek was a serial entrepreneur. He had so many ideas. And my biggest uh, challenge, I suppose, one of the opportunities was, Derek, which problem will we sort first? Or which problem and which product will we, will we uh, unlock expertise to help with first? But there were two fundamental areas of the business. One was actually um, working on water purification and novel ways and a novel technology to address some of the challenges within the developing world of water purification. And they have um, systems that are developed in chlorine dioxide and um, that, um, I suppose, we have helped them in multiple ways to enhance the product uh, processing and the manufacturing of those products, but also the fundamental chemistry behind the, the chlorine dioxide um, mechanism. They've worked with multiple universities from Strathclyde to Harriet Watt to um, Aberdeen, etc. But the other half of the business was developing personal care products. Um, and that was around um, you know, skincare products as much as um, brilliant products that um, don't um, allow Scottish midges or mosquitoes or otherwise to um, bite you. Well, that and wonderful. again, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what's been fascinating is because of the pandemic, you know, a lot of the problems that they are, a lot of the water and um, water companies that they were working with 
developing world. They couldn't travel. They couldn't actually um, make that happen overseas. But actually, they were able to really rapidly pivot the um, personal care market and to develop sanitizer, but also to look at some of the products and sanitizers that we needed for the NHS. And so whilst that was operated at two different separate streams of the business, or two different se separate business units, uh, they've meshed together over the last um, year and, you know, kind of really use some of the water purification method methods and manufacturing at scale to be able to also develop um, the personal care market. So it's been fantastic to look at, A, that company Thrive, but also how they've remained really committed to their local um, um, area and the place that they're based in. And so, again, go back to some of the staff or some of the um, so the people that live in that particular area, they've taken them on as apprenticeships and they would have been working, the apprentice would have been working in the hospitality and care industry. And so essentially we're out of the job. And Alistair has been so committed to helping his local um, area, has really taken them on and now upskilled them in engineering and manufacturing. So we've got a kind of complete circle where, you know, they're working with the educators on how do you take somebody that's skilled in hospitality and cooking to actually become an engineer of the future. So that's how the education aspect is, that is happening, along with pushing the frontiers of new products um, for um, sanitization in some of the hospitals. That's really so, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so some of, some of the um, projects that you're working on have really involved accessing skills and talent in uh, working with students, right? Uh, what What is your experience of, of managing these projects when students are really involved? Well, there's no doubting the passion of students to be able to help and work and have, have that experiential working. And um, I think it's also really great that the students get an opportunity perhaps to think about collaboration management is the phrase I use. So it may be their first you know, time that they've got to, I suppose, think about how do they communicate, to how do they present results, how do they actually, you know, make sure that um, companies are hearing on a timely basis what's happening. But they also have to kind of, I suppose, um, think about how does that fit into their coursework? Is what they're doing, you know, going to be, strive to be the best? It may involve a group of companies, a group of, sorry, a group of students working with the company. So that, again, will help and, you know, think about a team. And I think also what we're, what, you know, emerges from that may be the entrepreneurs of the future. So yeah. as part of the coursework, you know, the students get a taste for, oh, this is great. I like being kind of involved in a business. Um, and so they may think up of some of the ideas of their own that they want to craft around a business and get that kind of idea out to the marketplace. Or indeed, we may have entrepreneurship. So those students, when they're then going out and working in the world of work may themselves be driving new ideas and new and have the confidence within the company they're working with to say hang on a minute is there a better way of doing this and I think that's where you know the more experiential learning that can happen through the education system the better it's a win-win for everybody right I, I that's it's such a confidence builder for students to be able to participate in these types of projects and get those skills and share their knowledge and their you know innovative thinking out to the rest of the world the the, the partnerships that you you create i'm assuming you know they can be created and established with multiple types of organizations whether they're private public academic sectors you know all very different in how they operate in today's society do you feel that um one approach works for everybody or do you have to really kind of cookie cutter your that's an american term there by the way do you have to <laughs> customize your, your um your mission in terms for different ways of working for each of these types of sectors so there are some fund fundamental principles i think that um, are at the heart of any successful partnership i think every company every organization be it public or private you have to kind of have a bespoke conversation with them. So, but actually then the principles of identifying, you know, the, the right expertise, the capability and capacity, and um, we have well honed processes uh, to be able to do that. But I think it's um, fundamentally, I think for looking across the partnerships, you know, if you're going to collaborate with anybody, 
you know, you've got to think about some fundamental principles like communication. You know, I always think that if partnerships go wrong, some, somebody somewhere is waiting for something to happen and never actually raised their hand and said, hmm, should we be actually waiting? You know, should somebody be talking here? So communication for me is absolutely critical. Partnerships, be they public, be they private, there's a fundamental trust that needs to be established. You know, I, I always talk about is the chemistry right? And that might not be, not all, not all our partnerships are fueled by chemistry as in the discipline, the academic discipline. Do the people get on? Like any marriage, is it a, you know, are there fundamentals there that um, really kind of is around that chemistry? It really is so commu- Yep. So communication, chemistry and trust. And then I think it's about setting the expectations. So, you know, if you're working with an academic partner, Maybe that um, you're going to get a fantastic proving of an early stage concept, you know, testing that demonstrator, testing that feasibility. But are you going to have a product that's going to be absolutely ready for the shelves of Walmart, you know, within two weeks? No. So I think it's about managing those expectations and um, that, um, you know, what, what will be delivered through the partnership. So, so when you talk, you know, the- that's all very important, the communication and the, you know, the matchmaking and everything. When you talk with your businesses who are coming to you for help, what are the top tips that you provide to them for getting the most out of the collaboration? So I, I kind of have these con- open conversations in terms of how much resource do you have? So if you're going to enter a collaboration, you need to put time aside to manage it. You know, it's not that, um, you know, you need to put people resource. So, and I also think, um, you know, and I also encourage perhaps if, you know, if you're talking to the MD, um, it's a really fantastic opportunity for a team leader or for, um, you know, other organiz- uh, people within a business to actually, you know, learn and develop on how to manage uh, if they're managing a collaboration. So what resource do you have in place? And that's financial and that's people resource to manage a collaboration. What's your expectations? You know, if you're expecting an end product that's ready for a shelf, you might need to rethink that one. What's your time scales? Um, and also, what, what's your opinion around intellectual property? And I know that that's always an interesting debate, as in who owns <laughs> at the end of it. And I think one of the fantastic things that, you know, again, looking up, up the last 15 years where I've been involved in Interface is how much the Scottish universities have come together collaboratively. So one of the as, um, things that, you know, are in place for across the universities are standard legal templates. So if a company is working with a university or a particular um, um, way, um, there will be a, a legal template, a standard legal template that illustrates to the company exactly what happens you know, with respect to intellectual property. So these are great starting points that it's very clear up front to the company what way that the, the working practices are going to happen. And that's about openness and transparency. Um, and that's also about respecting, you know, that perhaps the companies come with the, the knowledge and the idea. Yes, it needs to um, tap into new knowledge within the universities, but actually commercially, it'll be the company that will be taking that forward for profit. But perhaps it's um, taking into account years and years of research across the um, academic de- um, department. So how that how that intellectual property arrangements is hugely important to, ar- um, to have in place straight away. So all of the kind of fundamental principles around openness, transparency, communication, uh, and really committed to making it work through resources, hugely important for the conversations with the business. And and I mean, that, that sounds just so smart, having all those contracts in place regarding the IP and, you know, all the data and everything else that's, you know, the processes that are being created. When you have a company who comes to you with an idea, um, is it... Are, are you always trying to find somewhere for, to match them up or do you ever actually say no to people and say, I love this idea, but just, you know, either the universities don't have the bandwidth for this, you don't have the bandwidth or you don't think it's a good idea. Like what is your decisioning process as the gatekeeper between the university yeah. and your business? So it's, it's a really good question. So, you know, because we, um, I guess, have got ambitious 
um, um, targets from our board. And um, we want to make sure that the partnerships we bring to universities are absolutely the best of the best. So the good benchmark is, you know, for 95% of the propositions we bring to universities, we identify expertise and about 90% of those go to discussion. So that's a really great, you know, standard to have. But obviously we do a fairly, you know, in-depth triage process at the beginning, which is, you know, about, goes back to, you know, what, um, what's what's the idea behind this? What are the, who are the people behind this? And almost have some, I'm going to say pre-qualifying steps, but that's probably, uh, you know, uh, the commitment. And that's about, you know, you can have lots of meetings with businesses and, they, and, and I learned this from a very early, uh, very early state, you know, and they can be really enthusiastic telling you all about what they want to do at the outset and then, oh, you know, sales come in or something else happens in the business. So that pre-qualification of, is this exactly what you want? If you don't hear back from them within, you know, a couple of weeks and you nudge them a couple of times, nothing comes back, so that's it. You know, we're not going to take that forward. So I kind of learned at a, at a very um, early stage, the kind of pre-qualification is important to, to kind of make sure that there's commitment. And then I talked earlier about, you know, the, the fantastic, um, I suppose, network and ecosystem that we have in Scotland here to be able to offer, you know, further support. So if it's a very early stage idea and not really um, honed out yet, then perhaps some of the um, support that they get through Business Gateway to develop a business plan is, becomes um, important before then perhaps they, can, they are um, mature enough to come back to work with the university. So it's about our, you know, our connections and knowing other organisations that can help businesses across Scotland. Are, uh, yeah, we're well networked. <laughs> well, that's good to know. So knowing that you work with, you know, a lot of universities and, and probably some colleges too in in Scotland, like as we look forward to 2021 and beyond, what future do you see for the Scottish universities to enable um, their recovery through the pandemic? So obviously, um, you know, the, the universities have been you know, financially, um, you know, hit through the through the um, pandemic. There have been huge concerns over, um, I guess, the um, ability to, you know, attract international students, which are, um, you know, really important for the for the mix of, of uh, education. Um, and I suppose the universities are also thinking, you know, uh, around their um, programs of work, of employability, etc. So that there were the concerns that were certainly foremost in the mind of many of the universities in the last 12 months and will remain so um, in terms of the financial viability, like any business. But I think what has really um, been hugely important to the universities has been their resilience. So, you know, the students are getting a fantastic education through um, online learning. The fact that so many businesses have rallied around and been able to offer experiential learning and um, virtual placements as opposed to physical placements has really helped um, the um, graduates of today and tomorrow. And I think above all, um, you know, the, the actual, I suppose, ways that research has come to the fore to actually support not just medical response, but also economic response, shows the, the breadth and depth of um, world leading research across Scotland's um, institutions. So I mentioned, you know, for example, business schools, and so many businesses have had to pivot very rapidly their processes and their actual business models. And so that's where business schools have been able to really step in and help so many businesses to kind of almost consider much um, new, new ways of business models that perhaps they haven't even thought about. So I think one of the exciting things have been almost new academics drawn into thinking about, oh, I can actually apply my knowledge with impact. And, and I think that's a direction of travel that we will see a lot more of in the future. Very, very interesting. Um, I don't think I have any more questions. Do you, Siobhan, have any more final thoughts for our listeners here? Um, I suppose I'm really conscious of, of listeners and I hope that you might want to pose me some questions. But, um, you know, I would be delighted if, you know, everyone on this call were an ambassador for, you know, what's happening in Scotland. I know there's a strong history and a strong knowledge of perhaps some of the um, inventions that have come from Scotland um, both, you know, many, many years ago. Um, but I hope that perhaps, you know, some of what I've explained to you this evening, um, this, uh, this afternoon, 
gives you a sense of the modern innovation, invention and impact that are emerging from Scotland's universities and colleges. There's a lot to be proud of. There's a lot to be ambassadorial for and a lot to advocate for. And I think our education system is really um, serving Scotland well. And um, so if you're interested in, in kind of, you know, getting involved in any way, um, you know, do, do um, you know, um, reach out. And um, we'd be delighted to kind of either share some more case studies or, you know, um, help maybe understand if you had some um, time to mentor or support some of the businesses that we're working with or other ways in which you could help them. So a lot to be excited about, a lot to celebrate and a lot to, um, I suppose, look forward to. And I think Scotland is a, is a modern, you know, innovative country. And I think the, um, I suppose in one sense, the jam and jute um, 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 perhaps or the heavy engineering um, invention may have moved on to other new areas around artificial intelligence and digital, but there's a lot to celebrate. Well, um, in closing, thank you everybody for attending today's event and thank you very much again, Siobhan. It's been really wonderful to have you here. Um, really delighted to hear everything that's going on in Scotland and as a Scot over here in San Francisco, it's really it's great just to, to hear everything that's going on. It makes me so proud. Uh, that is it for today. So thank you again to everybody for attending. I hope you have a great evening, great afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you. Bye. Bye.